Hello everyone. In this video, let's take a look at the fundamentals of magmatic ore deposits. When I say magmatic ore deposits, what I mean is the ore deposits that are found within igneous rocks or along their contents in which ore minerals are crystallized from a melt or were transported in a melt. All right then, let's begin. It is widely recognized that many of the chalcopyle and siderophile elements such as nickel, cobalt, platinum, palladium and gold are more likely to be associated with mafic rock types. Whereas concentrations of many lithophile elements such as lithium, tin, zircon, uranium and tungsten are typically found in association with felsic or alkaline rock types. What this means is magmas are more biased towards different elements and as such a fundamental understanding of what magmas prefer what elements is very much essential. Therefore, we shall begin with familiarizing ourselves with magma types and the metal deposits that the different magma types generally host. Theoretically, there can be an infinite range of magma compositions from ultramafic to highly alkaline varieties. However, for the sake of discussion, let's broadly classify the compositions into four categories, each representing a fundamental magma type, such as basalt, andesite, rhyolite, and alkaline magmas. Ore deposits associated with basaltic magma or mafic igneous rocks typically comprise a distinctive metal assemblage of nickel, cobalt, chromium, vanadium, copper, platinum and gold. The enhanced concentration of these metals in the source materials from which the basalts are derived is perhaps the reason why these metals form deposits in association with basaltic magmas. Similarly, ore deposits associated with granitic magma or felsic igneous rocks typically comprise a distinctive metal assemblage of lithium, beryllium, fluorine, tin, tungsten, uranium, and thorium. The incompatible nature of these metals are held responsible for their relative enrichment in felsic magmas. Unusual enrichment, however, results in ore deposits. Magmas that are depleted in silica and highly enriched in alkali elements such as sodium, potassium and calcium are known as alkaline magmas. This magmatic class also includes kimberlites which are known as primary sources of diamond. Though relatively rare, alkaline magmas are economically important as they frequently contain impressive concentrations of a wide range of ore forming metals such as copper, iron, phosphorus, zircon, niobium, rare earth elements, fluorite, uranium and thorium. And the reason for this metal concentration is attributed to the melting of a fertile mantle source rock. What I mean by fertile mantle rock is that the rock that is unusually enriched in the metals. However, when it comes to the kimberlites and diamond deposits it hosts, one must know that the kimberlites are only carriers of diamonds and diamonds won't crystallize in kimberlites unlike other magmatic metal deposits we have seen earlier. The intermediate magma or andesites are not popular for ore deposits as there are no significant deposits associated with the petrogenetic process of these type of rocks. We shall now look into some of the general processes that results in magma development. Formation of any magmatic rock or magmatic ore deposit is the result of the complex set of petrological processes that plays a very important role starting from site of melt formation during the melt transportation through the mantle or crust and to the site of final crystallization. The processes that control magma compositions include 
partial melting of the source rock and the interaction between the melt and unmelted restite minerals interaction with wall rocks the magma comes in contact with assimilation of partial melts of wall rocks mixing of magmas from different sources separation of magma into two or more immiscible melts and fractional crystallization of minerals in order to understand how magma compositions evolve or change during these processes one needs to have a little bit of geochemical background of magmatic processes don't worry if you have missed your geochemistry class i will tell you a few important things you should know in this video if you want to learn more on the geochemistry of ore deposits stay tuned to my youtube channel i'll be uploading a video related to the geochemistry of ore deposits shortly alternatively if you are an old school type and wish to learn by reading just check out the description box below for the list of textbooks and research articles which i refer for my geochemistry field so let's begin with getting familiarized with the concepts of partitioning of elements between phases a phase is formally defined as matter in a specific form it can be solid mineral crystal liquid melt phase or vapor melt phase magma typically includes multiple phases and is thus heterogeneous the solid mineral phase in magma may include unmelted restite minerals from the source rocks minerals lining conduits and magma chambers or minerals that have crystallized from the melt at every stage in the history of a magmatic system or a magmatic process there are chemical interaction taking place between phases remember at every stage there is an interaction between phases and this interaction is what controls the chemical budget of the magmatic system during these interactions elements are partitioned or distributed between the coexisting phases based on the thermodynamic principle of minimization of chemical energy how elements get partitioned between different phases in a magmatic system is dictated by the partition coefficients or k values of the elements there is a convention to write the partition coefficient that is when we are considering distribution between a mineral and a melt the mineral is commonly represented by a small letter in the numerator in this case a whereas the melt is represented in the denominator in this case b the numerical value of partition coefficients for any pair of phases depend on temperature pressure and the chemical composition of the phases the value of k also in principle depends on the absolute concentration of the element the equation for partition coefficient slightly changes when we speak about multiple coexisting mineral phases with the melt the bulk solid to liquid partition coefficient for element i is given by di now when the value of ki or the partition coefficient is greater than 1 for any given element it is then considered as compatible element and on the other hand if the value is less than 1 the element is deemed as incompatible when i talk about compatibility what i'm trying to imply is the compatible elements always prefer the crystal phase and they readily enter into the mineral during crystallization due to their favorable ionic size charge bonding and behavior on the other hand the incompatible elements are the most adamant ones and does not cooperate with the crystallization process and they do so by boycotting their entry into crystal phase thus they always remain in the melt phase their adamant nature is not intentional rather they are helpless due to their ionic radii charge bonding and behavior which prevents them into entering the mineral phase however a word of caution as with any other scientific theory or principle there is always an exception for the theory of elemental behavior in the magmatic system 
that is the compatibility of the elements can change any time during the crystallization history of the magma one must be very careful while interpreting the chemical budget of a given rock i hope that you got some basic understanding of the petrological and geochemical background of the magmatic process one thing you must remember is that the process of formation of magmatic rocks is similar to the process of formation of magmatic ore deposits the difference lies however in specific environmental conditions that results in the unusual enrichment of certain elements in the magmatic ore deposits we shall see the different type of magmatic ore deposits in the next video until then have a nice time bye bye